Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Um, real quick, I'll just give a, a quick uh, intro to uh, myself. My name is Jared Walker. I'm the EV Fleet Specialist uh, with the Electrification Coalition, um, working on a couple programs we'll get into briefly here. But um, definitely uh, want to say thank you to uh, Brian Bennett for uh, participating in the call. He's the Fleet Manager from uh, Des Moines and uh, just had a, a great, um, you know, couple couple uh, year and a half working together kind of figuring out a good opportunity to uh, you know find uh, an opportunity to implement electric vehicles uh, in the city fleet and Brian has been uh, very supportive of the program and of the alternative technologies and so it's great to have a chance to uh, to do webinar and you know just kind of discuss the, the thought process behind it and uh, thank you so much to Mac Easelhart uh, NCL leasing um, valued uh, partner in the program and uh, Matt has just been uh, there all along and, and super helpful with everything and um, yeah thank you gentlemen so much for uh, for taking part today uh, so with that I will uh, hop in and and like Sarah said if there's any questions put them in the, uh, the chat box or um, you know uh, feel free to uh, to ask them we're, uh, we're we're happy to receive any questions so um, just a little uh, Quick agenda, so we'll go through some collaborative updates, some updates from the Electrification Coalition. Then I'll hand it over to Matt, um, talk about some, some of the benefits that are available to cities and municipalities through the uh, cooperative. And then uh, we'll hand it over to Brian to, to talk about his experience with leasing uh, EVs. Uh, it's becoming a, a very important topic, uh, especially lately, and uh, there's a lot of benefits there. So and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, so just a little bit of background, the Electrification Coalition, um, we are, these are some of the programs that we've been a part of in the past and are currently um, uh, closely involved in are listed here to the right. So we're the technical lead of the EV Purchasing Collaborative, which we're going to really kind of focus on today. Um, at the same time, we're also working in the American Cities uh, Climate Challenge. Um, so that's uh, another program very, very uh, closely linked to the Climate Mayors Program, um, where we're doing a, a bit of a heavier lift for uh, some of the cities involved in that program. Um, working very closely with Smart Columbus, uh, and, and we have a very close relationship with the city of Atlanta. Um, Drive Electric Northern Colorado, we're the project lead of uh, that accelerator uh, program, as well as the accelerator program in Rochester. Uh, this is kind of a, an exciting announcement, something that's, uh, that's very new that, that we've been working on for the past couple of months here at the Electrification Coalition. We are uh, sort of announcing these, these states uh, as a, an increased effort on uh, driving forward policies at the state level to accelerate uh, transition to uh, electric vehicles and to really help facilitate uh, more of a holistic approach within that state. So these states are uh, Nevada, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. So uh, if you're in any of those states, um, it's very likely that we'll be in touch to kind of talk about some of the uh, some of the, the overlap and some of the work that we'll be uh, focusing on there. It's a very exciting opportunity. Uh, so to get into uh, the Climate Mayor's EV Purchasing Collaborative, um, it is a partnership partnership designed to help accelerate electrification of municipal fleets across the country. Um, so what does that mean? Um, basically, we have a, uh, a a large group of cities, about 450 or so cities at this point, that have signed up to participate and be a part of the program. Um, so these cities, uh, like the city of Des Moines, has shown leadership and, and really stepped up and said, you know, this is something we really want to focus on. We want to figure out um, what can we do to address climate issues, sustainability, and uh, oil dependence as well. And so one of the ways that we really leverage our focus is, uh, is on making it easier for cities to implement electric vehicles in their fleets. And so that's exactly what, uh, what Brian was able to do uh, in Des Moines. So just uh, wanna give a quick shout out to our website there, driveevfleets.org. Um, along with membership uh, in the Climate Mayors uh, group, you've also got our support. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. So all of our technical support is available uh, to assist cities and municipalities find those best opportunities to transition to electric vehicles. Uh, some, of the, some of the things that we're able to really uh, focus on through the collaborative. So we're increasing the procurement choice. So 
there are, uh, as a lot of people know that are on this call, probably familiar with, uh, there are LEVs, LEV states and ZEV states. So not all electric vehicles are available across the country. And so um, a lot of the benefits that we're able to do is we're able to leverage our access to vehicles that maybe would only be available in, say, California, and we can make those vehicles available across the country. So no matter what state you're in, uh, you have access to those vehicles. Um, reducing the administrative time, a lot of that um, comes from our, uh, our partners over there at Sourcewell. So Sourcewell is fantastic. They are a major uh, aspect of the program and they've got contracts that are checked out and executed and so cities are able to just go out there, uh, find a contract that works uh, for a product that they're looking for and all of the uh, RFP is done and so you're, you're getting a vetted price and um, you can really uh, save a lot of time going through that route. So it allows you to not have to go out to bid. By aggregating the national demand to lower costs, we are, as a group, this large group, hundreds of uh, cities in the collaborative, we're sending a clear message to the EV industry, to manufacturers saying, you know, we have uh, a, a tremendous number of vehicles that could be electrified and that, that ought to be electrified. So there's this, this pent up demand and um, you know, we're, we're hoping to keep this front and center as we continue to drive forward uh, progress on developing electric vehicles, developing uh, longer range batteries, increasing the capacity, um, and, and uh, eventually being able to electrify all of the uh, transportation um, in the country. And, and we see municipalities as sort of an incubator of that technology. Um, so the pre and post deployment planning. So we're right there, we're finding um, opportunities to, we can, we can analyze a fleet, look at what are the day-to-day -day activities that those vehicles are involved in? What is the, uh, the end user experience like? And then we can identify those best vehicles for electrification. Um, once we work through the process, identifying the best applications, we'll help to find the best models access our uh, low pricing as well as federal tax credit, which we'll get into a little bit later. And then also, what is the best way that we can deploy those vehicles? So over the years, we've been able to define some, some steps, some uh, road mapping type steps that allow us to avoid some of the common pitfalls that maybe we would uh, have run into in the past um, when deploying electric vehicles, maybe for the first time in a fleet. So we can really plan through all of that. And then um, the cooperative purchasing for uh, charging stations, just like for the vehicles, we work with a number of uh, EV charging vendors as well. And so the same kind of benefits that we're able to leverage for the vehicles and for the city planning process uh, is, is there for the stations as well. So kind of uh, just to kind of drill down a little bit more on what's available to members of the collaborative, our uh, staff and expertise remain on call. Um, so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're here to, um, to offer these best practices uh, for cities. And then also we, we do like to set up um, peer sharing opportunities, connecting different decision makers uh, across the country to kind of figure out what's the best way forward. Um, and then also, of course, uh, you know, access to all the vehicles and uh, charging stations. So just some quick snapshots of our, web, of our website there. I encourage everybody to go and check it out, driveevfleets.org. Uh, if you go out there, you'll see it's, it's really, there's a ton of information out there from FAQs to um, sort of sharing some of the best practices, guidelines, and uh, you know, it really helps a lot for cities to start developing this uh, EV program. So that's uh, just kind of a quick snapshot what it looks like. Again, I would encourage everybody to go out there We've got a lot of new vehicles coming online. We sent out a blast about uh, electric SUVs coming out last week. Um, pretty exciting stuff, so check it out. Um, currently, through the collaborative, we've got 200 cities, counties, ports, universities, and transit agencies that are committed to purchasing electric vehicles. Um, not necessarily always through the collaborative, but the majority of those are gonna be going through the collaborative. We encourage people to uh, you know, really kind of investigate what is your best option, and we've really put together something special here with the collaborative. And so it's, uh, it's, it's displayed in these numbers. And so year to date, we're at uh, 1,604 EVs procured 
And uh, again, that's, uh, that equates to 3,150 uh, light duty vehicles. And then another big number, 281 transit buses as well. So uh, it's a big, it, it's really grown significantly. It's been uh, great to be a part of that growth. Um, so to kind of touch on some of the vehicles that are out there, we've got some pricing out there. Um, right now we're kind of in the build out. So we're between model years out there on some of them. So you'll notice if a vehicle doesn't have a price next to it, um, we can, you know, it's, it's not that that vehicle is not available. Um, we'll just, we're just waiting on factory pricing and stuff like that. Uh, and then additionally at the top of this slide, you'll notice as well, those are the uh, charging station uh, vendors that we work with. And um, there's actually Clipper Creek as well. That's a, that's a new addition there. And so we can help to access those, uh, those charging stations. And for the most part, there are uh, 10 to 15% discounts through the collaborative uh, that's, that are available to municipalities uh, for those stations. Uh, another exciting uh, next step for us here are the addition of the school buses, uh, which we've been working on for a while. So that's very exciting. Um, that's really chugging along. And interestingly as well, we've got uh, two electric street sweeper vendors that are now, um, that we're now working with. It's Global and Madback. Uh, they each have kind of a unique offering, uh, but very exciting. And we've got a webinar coming up next week actually to, uh, to highlight their offerings. And um, it seems like that's a really great application. These, these street sweepers are quiet um, and, and very, uh, very efficient. So it's very exciting for us. Uh, and then kind of, uh, kind of at, heading over towards, uh, towards Matt's territory. Uh, these are the leasing options that are available through the collaborative and Matt will kind of discuss a little bit more about the, um, the offerings and, and sort of what makes uh, NCL a unique offering and, um, and how to leverage the tax credits, how we can really reduce the cost overall. There's a common misconception that leasing is actually more expensive than buying vehicles. And uh, that's, that's simply not true. And especially for electric vehicles, it's a great option. And so we have three vendors that we work with, DNM, National Cooperative Leasing and Enterprise. They each have uh, so, sort of a little bit of a different offering uh, for each of them. And um, so th that's also a great option. And then just as well, we were able to defer payments for up to a year. This is uh, something that we had discussed with Matt, um, very uh, helpful during this time. And, uh, that. So thank you so much. There's my contact information there. And um, so feel free to reach out. We've got, uh, we've got all of the, the uh, assistance that's available. And, and with that, I'll hand it over to Matt. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jared. Um, appreciate that. And so just to touch a little bit about us, my name is Matt Geisler. I am with NCL Government Capital, formerly National Cooperative Leasing. Um, we have been with, um, you know, we've been affiliated with Sourcewell for going on 20 years now, um, and we're the only company with Sourcewell that has a competitively bid and awarded contract for municipal leasing and financing. Primarily what we've done, you know, we've worked with, um, you know, we work with pretty much all of their vendors as well as the members um, of Sourcewell, you know, providing all types of solutions for financing or leasing. Primarily when, you know, we deal with municipalities when they're dealing with um, municipal leasing is the traditional five or six year finance agreement with $1 buyout. Um, you know, and that's typically what we deal with. We've always done it in the past, whether it's street sweepers, buses, refuse equipment, you know, construction equipment, whatever it may be. Um, but when we got involved with the coalition, um, the electrific or electrification coalition, we wanted to find something, you know, a little bit different, a little bit more unique, um, you know, to help out because as Jared was mentioning, there are some barriers with electric vehicles. You know, the primary one is overcoming the cost increase from your typical gas sedan into an electric vehicle. So when electric vehicles came out, they, the federal government released a tax credit associated with um, typically a $7,500 tax credit or up to $7,500 tax credit to um, all the way down to, I believe, $4,500, depending on the size of batteries, what plays a factor into it. And so when we got involved with it, we wanted to take a hard look at, as a, as a leasing agency, how can we 
how can a municipality take advantage of those tax credits? You know, as we know, municipal agencies, they don't file federal taxes. So those tax credits, they don't they do you no good essentially. You know, there is no benefit for it. So traditionally, you know, they'll either they'll either just pay cash for it, put it in the budget, or make that purchase. And so when we got involved with the coalition, we wanted to look at, well, how can we make this, how can we reduce some of those cost barriers? How can we get that tax credit involved? And so what we looked at is a couple different scenarios. And the solution that we came up with is it's called a track lease. So at the very basic, what a track lease is, um, for those of you who don't know, it is a track lease is, you know, for example, you're walking, you or I walk into a dealership and we're going to lease a truck or a car for three years. We make our monthly payments um, for those three years. Then at the end of the term, we have some options. We can either purchase that vehicle for the stated residual or we can return it and walk away. Okay. That's what a track lease is. So what we did is we, we decided, you know what, this is going to be our best you know, mode of financing for a municipal agency for a couple of reasons. One, that tax credit, it follows the owner of the vehicle. So if an agency was to purchase that vehicle, they own it, okay? That means they can't take advantage of that tax credit because you don't file taxes. So that tax credit does you no good. So what we do as a leasing agency is we actually purchase that vehicle from the vendor and then we turn around and lease it to the municipal agency, okay? And then what we do from there is, you know, I have some examples out there, but we take that federal tax credit because we're a privately owned company. And so we're able to take advantage of those tax credits. So we take that tax credit and we pass it down to the agency in the form of a lower payment or a cap cost reduction. What it does is that overall cost, it reduces your total cost of ownership. So for example, in the first example that I have up here, I use some round numbers. Um, take a Nissan Leaf, you know, most agencies, whether they lease vehicles or not in the past, they would just write a check for the $27,888.70. They own that vehicle. There is no tax credits. That's just their total cost of ownership. What we do or what we propose is we propose a track lease to them. Okay. So we set the, we set the payment, you know, we set the payment. Obviously there's interest correlated with it, um, cost of money. And so we set that payment. You can either make your monthly payments or you can do annual payments, which is a little, typically a little bit lower, make your payments. Then at the end of the term, you own that, or you can purchase that vehicle outright for the stated residual. So that residual is stated from the very beginning. So you'll know your total cost of ownership by the term. Payment does, the monthly payment doesn't change and the residual doesn't change, okay? And so what we do is we apply that tax credit then on is a is a more or less a, a payment at the end or an added residual, so it lowers lowers your monthly payment, essentially lowering your total cost of ownership. So instead of paying cash for that vehicle of twenty seven, you know, call it you know twenty eight thousand dollars, you can now lease it for two years, take advantage of that federal tax credit, and now your total cost of ownership is about twenty four five. So overall, by leasing the vehicle, you're actually saving the city anywhere from $3,000 to $3,500, um, you know, uh, total for the total cost of it. Whether you're buying one vehicle or 10 vehicles, you know, you're saving that amount of money by purchasing the same vehicle. At the end of the day, you still, you would still own that vehicle if you decide to purchase that vehicle or if you decide to purchase that residual. Now, it also does give you options though. Let's say at the end of the two years, you decide you don't want that vehicle or you want something different or you want to get away from it, you also have the option to walk away without committing the full amount of money to it. So that's really what we um, that's really what we've been doing. And the main reason why we did it is to help lower some barriers, help lower the cost of ownership, and help give some additional incentive to you know going electric. You know, help offsetting that increased cost of going electric. This way, you know, it makes the makes the, your cost analysis little bit more attractive when you're looking at gas versus electric. It brings that overall cost down by taking advantage of those federal tax credits. Um, so I have some examples on there. The way we set this up is on the two year term, it's your most cost effective way of owning that vehicle for the least amount of money. 
Obviously, the longer term you go, it reduces your monthly payment, but you also are accumulating more interest over the term of the loan. So on a 60 month loan or a 60 month term, you're gonna be paying more interest. So it is gonna cost you a little bit more as paying cash. Your break even is about 48 months, um, but then on the, the way we structure the 24 month term, that is your total, that is your total, um, total cost savings. Um, so I got a question here. Actually, let me see if I can address it right now. Alrighty. The cash price of the leaf. Um, so the cash price of the vehicle where that's coming from is that's just coming from the, our partner that we use from National Auto Fleet Group. So that price, we don't control the price of the vehicle. That is simply given us to the vendor, whether it's through National Auto Fleet Group or other vendor. Um, I, should, I should preface it that, that NCL, we don't set the price of the vehicle. We just, set, we just get the um, price from directly from the vendor. So that's where that comes from. But the main thing, the main thing is it gives you alternative options to help, you know, lower the cost of ownership, but as well as spread the cost out. Obviously, with times of budgets right now, um, you know, if there are, you know, budget constraints, they may be delaying purchase like this. You know, we have the options of doing extended terms, but as well as deferring the first monthly payment up to 12 months out. So you could take a, take a, take a delivery of the vehicle without having to worry about a payment for the next 12 months. So that's really what I have in essence on how we've been monetizing the federal tax credit. Um, obviously, if there's more questions, we can certainly address it um, at the end as well. So at that, you know, Jared, if you want to, you got anything to add or if you want to turn it over to Brian, we should be good. Yeah, that's great. No, I really appreciate that, Matt. Um, yeah, that, that, that helps a lot to kind of unpack sort of how that works and so how NCL is able to monetize the tax credit. And so essentially you're reducing that upfront cost, which allows you to have obviously then less, um, you know, less in, in interest to pay on the vehicle over the course of the, of the lease. And one of the things, I think there was a question that came in asking about the dollar buyout. And that's true, this structure of lease, it leases it down to a fair market value, right? So maybe, um, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the option to purchase a vehicle at the end of the lease or turn it back in a little bit more? Yeah, so there's really, when it comes to municipal financing, there's a couple options. One is um, a tax exempt municipal lease with a $1 buyout. On that option, you know, when, when we do a $1 buyout, um, the municipality, the agency, they own the vehicle from day one. So you're on the title, you cut, you're the owner of the vehicle. So when it's that structure, when it comes to electric vehicles, we, we can do that absolutely. Um, however, we can't pass along the tax credit because you would be the owners of the vehicle. So what we do instead is the track lease where there's a stated residual. That residual is set, you know, whether it's 20% or 30%, that's stated from the very beginning, knowing that at the end of the term, you can purchase that vehicle for that stated residual value at the very end. So at the end of the day, your total cost of ownership, whether you do it over a $1 buyout or on a, on a track lease with the stated residual, your cost of ownership is gonna, would be less with that federal tax credit involved. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks if That a lot. makes sense. For sure. Yeah, and of course, you know, if, if there's or any other questions or anything like that, you know, feel free to put it in the chat or just let us know. And I'm sure that Matt will be able to, uh, to address any of those questions. Thanks, Matt. Absolutely. And uh, so here's uh, Matt's contact information here. Um, so feel free to reach out directly um, or reach out to us. We can, um, you know, we can set up a call if there's any, um, you know, if you have any questions that you want to take offline. Uh, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll hand it over to Mr. Brian Bennett. Uh, Brian is the fleet manager from the city of Des Moines, Iowa, and as I mentioned earlier, has been uh, a big supporter of the program uh, since, since really the, the early days, and um, he's here to share his firsthand experience with leasing through the collaborative. So thank you so much, Brian. You're welcome, and, and thank you, Jared, and, and thanks to the e EC. Uh, I guess uh, my role today is I, I'm a little bit of a living proof that the system does work and the processes are in place. So uh, 
I appreciate everyone's time today, especially the participants. Uh, uh, at this point, probably in municipal management or fleet management, we're, we're getting a little bit wore down of this type of contact. So I do appreciate you participating today, and it looks like we've got good participation. The uh, Briefly about myself, I'm in my 19th year of fleet management uh, in the city of Des Moines. It's something that I was not uh, really classically trained in. So you, you really have to love uh, this country, uh, the state of Iowa and the city of Des Moines where in a, a central Iowa farm kid as an agronomist can become uh, the fleet manager for the capital city. So uh, I, I've enjoyed that tenure as fleet manager and, and enjoyed the changes in technology. So really this, uh, this came as a natural for me to look at how we might electrify our Des Moines fleet because it does represent a huge change in technology. Uh, by no means, I, I don't want to claim, <clears throat> excuse me, to be the subject matter expert. Um, you know, EC has that, and, and of course, uh, Matt is a, much more of an expert on the leasing. Uh, but I can, I, I can uh, share briefly uh, kind of a summary of the Des Moines stor story. Um, everyone should know currently, uh, I'm just in receipt, uh, just as of last week, of the first two of four Nissan Leafs that, that we have on order. Uh, without going into the entire process, there was a, a delay in pricing the Nissan products, uh, so we anxiously awaited those. And then, so we have just now received the first two, and they are not in service yet uh, to our receiving department. So I, I don't have runtime data, but I, I do have um, a, a few bullet points here uh, that will speak really to our process. Um, one thing for us. Uh, as we looked at electrifying the fleet is we really needed a, a catalyst or what I labeled a, a change agent. Um, as much as we'd like to think as fleet managers uh, that we have this great authority, at, at least the way we're organized in Des Moines, I did not have that wholesale authority to uh, simply dive into electric vehicle uh, and convert conventional sedans to that. Um, we have centralized acquisition in Des Moines. Uh, but we serve all departments and actually a couple of outside agencies of repair and maintenance and acquisition. So it's ultimately up to the receiving departments of how they uh, procure uh, vehicle and equipment replacement. So it was a little bit of an uphill battle for me just to begin with. The, the catalyst for us or a really defining moment was as the makeup Um, there was one particular council person uh, that was adamant uh, about electric, ve all electric uh, vehicle, uh, not just, a, we have a, we have a, a fleet of uh, gas electric hybrids. I think we have 50 or 54 in the fleet right now, but he wanted to take the next uh, transitional step and move into EV. So that was a catalyst for us, a real, a, a real driving change. Uh, we also had uh, within the last year, a couple of more positions on our seven member board. Uh, I, I would say they're environmentally friendly. So uh, there is still a minority of our elected council, but there's sufficient um, political wherewithal there to, to drive this change. And um, if uh, as a participant today, I, I think many of you, if not exclusively our government or municipality, at least in the case of Des Moines, and this might be the case with your organization, it has high buffering capacity. That is, it, it, there's a high capacity for resistance to change is what I've found over the 19 years. So it, it did take that catalyst to really challenge us as a fleet group of how we could electrify the fleet to be environmental stewards while also uh, providing the, the appropriate tool and the proper tool of, of, of a car and a sedan to our receiving departments. So um, we were fortunate to have that support. So I, I, I hope that you have that in your organization at the highest elected official, let alone at senior management level of city manager. Um, the, um, the other major point I wanted to speak to is uh, for this to work for us financially. And, and by the way, uh, this is a little bit unusual organizational structure. Um, the fleet division uh, that I uh, work in is actually uh, part of the finance department. So it's a little bit of an anomaly for a municipal model, but it has worked for us. And that, that change also was in the last couple of years. Um, 
the, the paradigm shift that I want to describe is we needed to look at a means of procurement that was not simply a municipal uh, competitive specification with a, a, an award to a low bid. So that really drove us to contract purchasing, which we've been using um, uh, almost exclusively. We purchase our vehicle and equipment replacement um, off of known established uh, governmental contracts. So that's the source well uh, contract that, that uh, was referenced before. And then specifically National Automotive Fleet Group as a contract holder to provide EVs under that contract. Um, we needed to shift away from that um, low bid process uh, for us to incorporate life cycle costs of EVs. Um, the, the, the contrast that we would have made typically would have been, uh, this is a couple of years ago because of the delay in, in, in pricing and delivery. Uh, we were comparing uh, the Nissan Leaf to a Ford Fusion conventional sedan, mid-size sedan that's on our state of Iowa contract purchasing documents. Um, and we, need to, we needed to have that paradigm shift to where we could now start to incorporate fuel costs, some ex expected residual, um, uh, and really get closer to a total cost of ownership. Um, Previous to this, four or five years ago, we were putting out competitive specifications for mid-sized sedans or, or any type of vehicle and equipment and soliciting responses from local vendors. So the shift to contract purchase and then the next, next step was to incorporate um, our analysis of those lifetime costs, including fuel costs, obviously electricity versus um, unleaded fuel and residual values were so important to us. Uh, that really allowed us to get to what I've labeled here on my uh, the, the bullet point slide of we've approached financial parity. Uh, if you recall, match sharing of the, the purchase price around uh, 28,000, uh, but there, there's a net effect there uh, once you lease it for 24 months. And we, by the way, we, we did opt for a 24 month term, but we're making two annual payments and then um, uh, a, a residual buyout. So uh, we need to think in terms of when we compare these, uh, the purchase price, uh, use 25,000 25, or, or uh, the, the net of a lease arrangement because you want to take, of course, credit for the federal tax incentive. Um, I just checked this morning our state of Iowa contract has been updated for a conventional mid-size sedan and that's actually a Chevy Malibu this particular contract season so that it's an $18,000 cash outright purchase price so um, you know there, there's there's another additional $7,000 that we have to essentially close that gap on so when we did our previous analysis those were very close to the raw numbers um, you know, we're not there. There's obviously a cost to the EV uh, because of the upfront cost. You can't recoup it all. But what we felt in our final recommendation to our council uh, for the award of, of this type of lease arrangement was that that uh, remaining additional cost, which I, I'm not presenting it today because it's subject to, of course, what's your local fuel cost? What do you want to use for that? What do you want to use for your own repair and maintenance? Um, Ours is all in-house repair and maintenance. You know, perhaps some of yours is contracted for. So a lot of variables to go into that equation still resulted in, for a few thousand dollars, I think ours was an, an additional $2,600 that we didn't show that we would recover. Uh, fortunately, our council viewed that as the worth of environmental stewardship. That is to say, we, we as a city are willing to pay some additional monies to have zero tailpipe emissions. So that was, that was a, a very important for us as we uh, worked through that. Um, kind of the last uh, aspect of the Des Moines story that I wanted to share today is perhaps, uh, I, I don't think it's unique to Des Moines. Uh, I've talked to other fleet managers and, and this is fairly typical. The actual implementation uh, of EVs and ultimately, uh, you know, our goal is to have our end users accept that. So 
very specific for Des Moines, the, these initial four Nissan LEAF EVs, they'll actually be placed in our community development uh, department uh, and they will be driven by property inspectors. So these are uh, staff that will go out in the community and have regular scheduled inspections for property that may be in uh, to the, the, the goal of that this added division is to address some uh, internal blight. So they are just uh, you know out and about on streets. Uh, they're, they're only going to be driven about uh, eight, total 8,000 miles a year, 50, 50 miles a, a day, certainly within the electric range. Um, and it's, it's a good fit. We think it's a good fit. That's those inspectors that are doing similar tasks now are in a couple of different types of vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are in four wheel drive pickup trucks. So that became the preference for that inspector. Uh, there are some others that are in uh, some of our fleet of uh, Toyota Prius hybrids. So the that particular slot in the fleet, uh, as we went to replace and add to, called out for a sedan and by way of our established policy that these should then be all electric or EV sedans. So um, we've had several rounds of meeting with inspectors um, and we're in a little bit of a luxury moment right now where these are newly added staff so they, they don't come to us with a cultural or, or a bias of I need a pickup truck to do the job. Uh, so we're uh, hopeful that that will meet their needs. Uh, second part of the story is as we start to replace uh, sedans that are driven by police detectives. And so this is going to be uh, a, a little bit of a larger challenge for me because uh, those detectives now are, on, are in conventional uh, four-door sedans. Um, there is some concern about the creature comforts and the entire cargo space. Uh, the fact that these EVs are, are basically a hatchback, uh, they don't have a lockable trunk. S certain functions of detectives require that they secure some items and secure evidence occasionally. So. We do have, um, that's really the only remaining obstacle. I, I didn't want to label it that way for this presentation, but th that is that concern of acceptance uh, by that end user. So we really need to have some runtime on these. Um, I, I, I will kind of say this to summarize and, and conclude some of the speaking points is the, the, the lease construction really allowed us to uh, venture into this. We, we didn't have to look at uh, a large acquisition of 10 or 12 or, or 20 vehicles at one time. So it is a way that we can get into it. If there's certain areas where just they just absolutely will not work for a particular department, we can reassign them and, and we can go down a different path. So I, I think the flexibility, um, I could have carried that probably as a, as a closing uh, point is the flexibility of the process that's uh, available uh, through EC, source well contract, National Automotive Fleet Group, and the various leasing companies, uh, that, that flexibility should be very valuable uh, as you go down your path to electric vehicles. So, um, Jared, that's really all, that, all I'd prepared, so I don't, uh, do I, is there any questions or do I need to see that? Uh, no, that's, him? that's, Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, Brian. And I think that, you know, sharing your experience is invaluable to other cities, other municipalities that are looking at sort of heading down this route. And, um, you know, just a couple of things that I, that I just jotted down as you were um, just sort of going through your, um, your experience. Uh, I think it's critical to highlight what you were saying about the, the TCO. So that is the total cost of ownership. Um, versus a process that's just going to prioritize the lowest upfront cost. So there are, as we know, there are these hidden costs associated um, with a traditional uh, ICE, internal combustion engine gas vehicle, like maintenance, and there's just obviously the higher uh, cost of fuel. So typically, if we're looking at analyzing uh, a standard vehicle, we'll assume a 25 mile per gallon uh, sedan, versus an electric vehicle, typically we come to about 50 to 56% savings on the electric vehicle just from fuel alone. 
So we're, you know, capturing some of that. There's obviously a slightly increased upfront expense to getting the electric vehicle, um, which then you're also offsetting by doing the lease as well. Um, so there's just a lot that goes into making this decision. And so I really liked that you were able to highlight that you're able to look at that full TCO, leveraging the source well contract as well, um, you know, as an opportunity to one, reduce your administrative burden. There's a cost associated with that. And as well as the time associated with that. Um, and it allows you to feel confident that you're moving forward with that right decision. So I, I wanted to highlight that that TCO calculation. And that is something as well that the Electrification Coalition is absolutely prepared um, to assist any, any of uh, our city partners with uh, as we move forward. It's something that we do frequently uh, to analyze fleets and to really understand what is that cost savings opportunity uh, that's there. And then also, um, you know, just sort of looking at the, the ideal applications for the vehicles. So you mentioned the building inspectors. And I know this is an application that you and I had discussed uh, several times as you're kind of walking through the process. And this is something that's been really interesting that I've noticed personally um, in my dealings with cities that are, that are trying to identify these opportunities uh, to electrify the building inspector application is, is oftentimes a path of least resistance. And so, um, you know, obviously you highlighted some of the challenges there. There's some cultural uh, challenges, you know, you might, be trying to shift uh, end users from a pickup truck into a sedan and you know we can work through all of that but um, you know that's that's the real world uh, uh, scenario and I really appreciated um, you know your uh, explaining your your uh, your story yeah thank you Brian and Matt and Jared um, we do have a couple of questions coming in so I'll go ahead and get started and if anyone has any additional, you can put them in the chat and address them to me or to the whole group, um, however is easiest for you. So this first one, Brian, is just a specific about um, some of the, your note about the pickup trucks. They just asked, um, what are some of the reasons given by um, property inspectors for needing pickup trucks? And if it was just like a general preference, and I know from some of my experiences, for the most part, it's preference, but sometimes there is um, needing a higher clearance or needing a four-wheel drive or, or something like that, but in general. Um. No, great, great question. Thank you for that. And I, I could have touched a little bit more on that is the, uh, what, we, what we see, uh, and other fleet managers may see this too, is over, over time, I've seen the municipal fleet start, the composition of it start to emulate kind of a private fleet. So that is, if the building inspector has a personal uh, pickup truck, there became a cultural expectation that, well, I'll drive a pickup truck for work also. Um, specifically for Des Moines, it was the wintertime driving in our snow and ice control event. Very legitimate question. Um, in fact, the, the particular division went to the extent to take a video of how the Toyota Prius had lower ground clearance and basically failed to you know, climb up a hill uh, during a snow event. So those became the exceptions, but um, the, the inspectors desired, of course, the four wheel drive pickup for traction and drivability in a snow event. They are tasked, um, a, a different segment of the inspectors are tasked with some uh, nuisance collection of illegal yard sign or it, some illegal dumping. So there is a legitimate need for a pickup bed payload space so that's why we targeted the, 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 the property management, the ones that were just inspecting properties because uh, they don't have that payload capacity. But pr primarily the reason they like the pickup truck, there are some creature comforts. They most likely drive a pickup truck or an SUV to work. They would like to have similar class for their work vehicle uh, and then some, some maneuverability during our snow and ice control. I, I told them that's a public works issue if, if they're not getting the streets clean enough for their inspections. So. I think we'll get through it. Uh, good point, so good point. Thanks, Brian. Um, we also had a question about how Des Moines purchased your charging infrastructure. Uh, that was really easy for me. There was a historic decision that once we went electric that I actually got out of the fueling business and it switched 
to our facilities division because it's coming from a building infrastructure. So I love that. If, if you don't have that luxury, I do know that our facilities group uh, utilize a, an existing procurement contract to put uh, charging uh, state infrastructure in place. I don't have the specifics of those particular chargers. So um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna kinda of have to dodge that. I mean, I can get that, I can find that information out, maybe get it to Jared and Sarah and, and get it dispersed. But, uh, we clearly went down the path that fleet services would retain management of all liquid fuels, our unleaded, our diesel and our biodiesel. But once we went electric, it shifted to uh, facilities management, which I, I welcome that. I, I did not fight that. So facilities provides the charging structure, infrastructure in Des Moines. Thanks, Brian. I, um, there's another question here too on um, basically your charging infrastructure strategy. So if you, you know, have enough EVs to be in that position yet and just how you handle charging management and locations. I, I do, I do, I, I did have, obviously did have input on the infrastructure. Um, and in this case, we wanted to have the availability of a dedicated charging potential uh, for each of those community development inspectors. Uh, so that's actually going to be in place in a, it's, 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 a, it's a public parking garage. It's a park and ride facility, uh, but it is reserved for, for city vehicles. So um, we wanted to provide that. Now I know there's uh, current ongoing discussions uh, without resolution yet. Uh, uh, there may be certain advantages. Uh, there's probably some grant monies available that if you can make that charging station uh, available to public during the, what I'm gonna call the non-city use, because if you think about the use of a building inspector, they're basically reporting to the work at seven or 7.30 in the morning and their, their work day is till three or 3.30. So when that vehicle is not in that dedicated parking stall, I think there's gonna be some advantages for not only the public, but this, uh, on the city side to make that available for some uh, public charging. So um, it's a, the infrastructure actually seemed to be a little bit more complex than the acquisition of the vehicle. So um, that, that's, that's all I can really uh, uh, know, to, know today. Uh, obviously, I can try to get some more information out to people. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks, Brian. Um, looks like we have another question here from Sky. Uh, so Sky writes, Jared, can most cities get by with level one charging stations? And, you know, that's a question we get a lot. Um, I would say just like a lot of things, um, it depends would be the answer. So there are certainly some cities that don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, if the vehicle uh, is going to be parked uh, overnight for an extended period of time, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, especially if it's, you know, one or two, when we start building out larger fleets, that's when it really starts kind of um, the benefits of having that level two charging really kind of help out, um, you know, to kind of bridge that gap. One really important thing that I always like to hit on though, is we, we don't recommend a one-to-one -one ratio. So that is a one vehicle to one charging station ratio. Um, we, we do recommend a two-to-one or even in some cases three-to-one uh, three vehicle, say, to one level two charging station uh, ratio, making sure that we're sort of maintaining that battery in between 80 and 20 percent. So that's one of the things that a lot of people uh, often overlook with EVs too, is the range is there. You know, it's, um, you know, maybe in the past there were, uh, there was a little bit of less range, but now we have vehicles that are going hundreds of miles on a charge. And so really, um, realistically, you would only need to charge that vehicle, you know, a couple times a week, even if you're using it every day. And you don't need to top it up, uh, you know, even if you have 60% of battery, um, that's oftentimes more than enough to, uh, you know, to complete your shift. So I, I hope that that uh, helps out a little bit. Uh, sure. I have a question here for you about, um, you know, a lot of cities have never leased vehicles before. Um, and so if you just have kind of like um, recommendations on how to broach that kind of internally and if you help the city in that way and um, also just, you know, any general recommendations you have for folks that have never leased before and what their sort of like next steps should be. Yeah. 
Is that a question for me or? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the question that we've been dealing with a lot lately is, you know, in general leasing versus buying, um, you know, at, at the end of the, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's the city's responsibility to manage the taxpayer dollars. Um, and we've been getting a lot of questions as of recently, you know, with, you know, tighter budgets, um, purchases being delayed, um, or spending freezes in general. Now, obviously, <clears throat> equipment purchases still need to happen. And so how is the best way that, you know, we can get into it? Um, you know, how do we, how do we go about doing it the least expensive way? You know, and there's a, and, you know, so it's, it's an internal process, you know, what the city, what the city wants to do, um, what they deem best. Um, and with leasing, there's tons of different ways to lease vehicles, you know, or equipment, whatever it may be. A lot of different ways you can go about doing it is finding, but what we do is, you know, we take more of a consultative approach, figuring out what the needs are and how we can, you know, how we can get, you know, directly to it, you know, how we can find, you know, what's best for the city. Um, and that's why how we came up with this solution, this specific solution, I should say, for electric vehicles is taking advantage of that tax credit because essentially you're saving money by leasing with that tax credit as opposed to outright purchase. But for cities that have never leased in the past, um, you know, I'm fully aware, you know, it is, you know, an uphill battle sometimes to get everyone on the same page with that. And, you know, it's becoming more and more viewed as a more necessary or necessity. You know, we've been dealing with more larger cities across the country that have typically always, you know, have a very strong cash budget that have recently, they decided, you know what, we're going to conserve that cash looking into the future and we're going to start leasing and financing, you know, all of our purchases. That's a decision they made internally, you know, in ways to conserve their cash. So as far as finding a, a direct answer on why, you know, how you can, you know, overcome, you know, the leasing is, you know, it's really an internal preference on which ways works best for the city. You know, if paying cash for a city is the best alternative for them, you know, that's the direction that you should go. Um, you know, however, if, you know, if there's ways where you can save money by leasing and taking federal tax credits, by all means, that's the solution that we have provided. So I hope that kind of roundabout answer of answering that. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Matt. I think, you know, it's one of the things that, that you're highlighting really clearly is the opportunity to prevent your cash from being tied up, you know, in, in assets. And so it's a great opportunity uh, to allow cities to get into the electric vehicles, get into these vehicles, start lowering your maintenance costs, start lowering your, your fuel cost, and getting used to, you know, managing uh, electric vehicles and also realizing too, that, you know, these are still just cars, um, you know, you just plug them in and, um, you know, that once people have that experience, they realize like, oh, it's actually a better uh, driving experience. It's a, it's a more reliable vehicle and a less costly vehicle. And then also certainly, you know, accessing the tax credits, accessing source well, and then really approaching the entire process strategically, which is exactly what you're saying. You know, sure. let's look at what, what are these opportunities? What is the opportunity to save money? And, um, you know, to, to kind of hit on what Brian was saying earlier as well, it's not just the upfront cost of the vehicle, but over time we can really zero in on what that cost savings potential is going to be with an electric vehicle and at that, at least electric vehicle as well. Yep. Um, there's another question here from Sky. So uh, great question, Sky. Uh, what specific assistance can the collaborative give cities and do you need to be a member to receive that help? So um, we are, the, the collaborative is here to, uh, to help cities across the board uh, to electrify their fleets. And so uh, I guess the answer really is you don't have to be a, a member. Obviously it's great if you're, um, you know, if you're a city leadership uh, like the city leadership in Des Moines is, um, you know, front and center and, and leading uh, by example and, and you know, uh, and promoting the, the work of the collaborative. But there are some cities that prefer not to be listed and that's totally fine. We're here to transition electric vehicles uh, into city fleets. And so to transition gas cars out of fleets and switch into electric vehicles. So 
Um, I would say uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. I can put my uh, contact information back up there as well. Um, you know, reach out to, uh, certainly reach out to Brian, reach out to Matt, and, um, you know, let us, and let us know. So we're, we're more than happy to assist. Thanks, Jared. And I'll highlight too that um, all of the, the EC is a nonprofit and all the help through the collaborative is, um, you know, a good trusted source and that we also have all public fleets. So counties, universities, school districts, does, you don't have to be a city. So. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's one of the things that's important to highlight is, is that is, you know, we have worked to, to develop this collaborative to be the most uh, helpful to municipalities. And so um, it's, it's, it's a great program. So we would encourage you to take advantage of it. Cool. All right. We'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, thank you so, so much to our speakers, Matt and Brian and, and Des Moines and National Cooperative Leasing. And I will share out the slides and recording as well as their contact information so that you can follow up if you have any questions. Um, we are happy to help you however um, we can right now, especially. So please don't hesitate to reach out and have a good rest of your day. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you. Everybody have a great day.